So our next speaker, Joshua Russell, holds an undergraduate degree in anthropology from the University of Tennessee and is about to complete a Master of GIS degree at Penn State University in December. He has served in Peace Corps Ghana as an agroforestry extension volunteer and has served a year-long service term with the University of Oregon's AmeriCorps RARE program, where he worked extensively on the pro motion of enhanced food security in rural Northeast Oregon. Joshua is presenting plantain agroforestry in Uganda, integrating cultural legacy into, oh, excuse me, into multi-criteria decision analysis. Hey, good morning, can uh, you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> Excellent. Uh, all right, thank you uh, for having me here today to present my capstone project uh, next. And here's just a brief outline of the subject uh, areas that I'll be covering today. Next. Uh, first, I wanna provide a little context uh, for this research and talk a bit about food security, uh, which is the central issue uh, that this research is structured to address. The IMF notes that as of 2022, approximately 1 billion people globally are food insecure, uh, with approximately one third of that number residing in Sub-Saharan Africa which makes this one of the most food insecure regions in the world. A lack of resiliency toward climate change, slow economic growth with stubbornly high inflation specifically for food items, and a lack of agricultural supply chain infrastructure are significant drivers of food insecurity in this region. Additionally, gov government subsidies for fertilizer and seed have driven overuse and suppressed crop diversification. Here, uh, I have listed two of the key sustainable development goals that relate to the process of assuring food security. To meet specific SDG2 objectives of achieving food security and promoting sustainable agriculture, as well as SDG15 objectives of promoting sustainable use of ecosystems and the halting and reversal of land degradation, agroforestry is and has been promoted uh, as a technology to actualize these goals. Next. So what exactly is agroforestry? Uh, well, it's more than simply agriculture with trees. Rather, uh, agroforestry is an agroecological approach that involves uh, farmers, livestock, trees, and forests at multiple scales, including trees on farms, farming in forests and at forest margins, and tree crop production. It leverages the ability of trees to store carbon, draw water and nutrients from the soil, shelter biodiversity, build soil organic matter, and record climate history. Essentially, agroforestry presents a holistic systems approach, which stands counter to the practice of monoculture food crop production. In the context of this project on plantain-based agroforestry in Uganda, plantain is considered as a central component of the mid-tier of a mixed or traditional agroforestry system, as it provides shade for lower story crops such as cassava or beans, as well as uh, providing mulch from the, the plantain leaves, uh, while ideally gaining wind protection, shade, and nutrient cycling benefits from upper story trees such as mahogany or dahoma. Next. So why are we looking specifically uh, at Uganda? Uh, in the mid-aughts, I spent some time working in, in northern Uganda with an undergraduate mentor of mine so I have a little bit of exposure to the uh, vast linguistic, cultural, and geographical diversity that exists in that country. Um, it should be noted that uh, of the 49 million people residing in Uganda, nearly 1.5 million are refugees fleeing conflict from the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. This influx of refugees is contributing to the challenge of assuring food security within the country, uh, one that has already experienced decades of insurgent conflict uh, from groups such as the Lord's Resistance Army that at its height uh, left approximately 2 million people displaced and relocated into internally displaced people's camps. Uh, nearly all those camps have been disbanded, though the effects of displacement on land tenure and ownership are still felt and provide significant challenges for smallholder farmers in Uganda today. Uh, and also worth noting that nearly one third of that population total population in Uganda is food insecure. Um, it's, uh, yeah, next. So 
So uh, in addition to just having spent some time there while I was there, uh, one thing that was nearly ubiquitous uh, everywhere that I ate, certainly in the southern half of the country, was a food item called matoke, which is steamed plantain. It is uh, such a, a key food item for so many people from that country. Um, and specifically when I talk about Matoke and as I get more into the ethnographic research portion of this, um, sometimes it will, it will just be simply referred to as Matoke or plantain, may uh, more specifically be called the East African Highland banana. Uh, for the terms of this research, uh, I've considered them all to be indicative of plantain. Um, so I think one, one element, when I started doing literature review for this, for this project and trying to frame up my approach, something began to stand out to me, and it's notably with the absence of this. So there's a, a vast number of academic works out there of how multi-criteria decision analysis, and typically GIS and PBA, uh, can be applied for determining site suitability. Common criteria may be you know, topographical, ecological, environmental, uh, or dem even demographic uh, criteria. But what I don't see is the inclusion of cultural legacy. Um, it's not to say that it doesn't exist. Rather, I contend that GIS and CDA is an efficient and effective tool for researchers and decision makers alike, and the inclusion of cultural legacy data uh, either gleaned through ethnographic research or participant survey if you're able to carry out field work within the MCDA process can provide a measure of willingness toward adoption of a practice, uh, which uh, in this case is plantain-based agroforestry. During my Peace Corps service in Ghana, West Africa, I was tasked with the promotion of agroforestry systems to smallholder farmers, and I've seen firsthand when a proposed solution fits the ecological criteria but is lacking cultural context or connection. Uh, in the absence of cultural connection or, or, or legacy, uh, the uptake of technology is significantly diminished. Uh, next. So the broad goals uh, for this work are twofold. First, uh, it must be determined which areas of Uganda are ecologically suitable for plantain production. And this will be uh, achieved through binary valued GIS and PDA. Second, a primary data set will need to be constructed through ethnographic research to uncover the relationship of all linguistic groups in Uganda toward plantain cultivation and consumption. Taken together, this data should offer valuable reflections of where plantain agroforestry is both ecologically and culturally suitable, thus offering an enhanced capacity for uptake and participation with this technology. Next. So uh, to achieve this uh, de determination of ecological suitability, uh, I was, you know, I'm using ArcGIS Pro. Uh, at right, you can see my selected uh, ecological criteria uh, for the values, a range of values and sources for each. And you know, there's the, the, the essential pre-processing steps that you would do just to get your data ready. And then uh, I'm basically reclassifying all of these items to a binary uh, value of either one being suitable, zero being uh, unsuitable. Next. This is where the bulk of my time has been on this project, which is uh, gathering the, the ethnographic data that would indicate whether or not a linguistic group uh, does either consume Use, uh, uses plantain as a staple or is actually using uh, plantain as part of an agroforestry system. Uh, the protocol employed for collecting data on plantain consumption was adapted from my capstone advisor, uh, Dr. Brahman Powell's work on stego palm consumption in Papua New Guinea. The employment of this protocol leverages Google Scholar as the primary search engine with which key phrases are built from the name of the subject matter and the name of the linguistic group. So something like Acholi and plantain, or Buganda and plantain. Then within each pertinent ethnographic result identified in this query, the subject term could be plantain or agroforestry or staple, that, that was a key one for me, uh, can be searched within the document. 
And ideally, a minimum of two quotes per linguistic group can be extracted and recorded, as well as uh, the citation information into an Excel uh, worksheet. With this information, further definition of the group's relationship to plantain will be recorded in classified responses to the following question. Do they consume plantain? Is plantain a preferred staple food? And is, in, is plantain part of an agroforestry system? The responses to that are either yes, no, or unknown for each of those. Yes would be a positive value, so that's a one. No or unknown would be a zero value. Next. So in the image at the left, just to give you a little reference, uh, I have, this illustrates the major language families in Uganda and their distribution. In the South, uh, something to note, like the Bantu and the Central Sudanic peoples in the Northwest have a little bit more cultural similarity in that, that agriculture is something that is, is commonly used among both, even though the, the Central Sudanic have a little bit of a, more of a mixed system of uh, pastoralism and agricultural uh, practice. Uh, and the images uh, in the upper right, uh, I have illustrated all 40 language groups. Uh, it's my shape file for each uh, of the 40. Uh, in green, you can see where I've, this illustrates where I've noted plantain consumption. And in pink, it shows areas where it is not noted in ethnographic research. And then the image to the right illustrates uh, those language groups where uh, plantain has been considered uh, as a staple or noted as a staple. Next. And again, just to provide a little visual reference to the, to the geography and the topography, um, when we look in this image in the upper right, this kind of reflects what the pastoralist groups like the Karamajong, this is what their landscape is kind of like. Um, and the, the image in the bottom uh, right shows uh, what I was talking about, like with the Lubara in the, uh, for a, a central Sudanic group that has a mixture of agriculture and livestock rearing. And then in this, uh, the bottom image, pretty typical image of the agricultural practice as conducted by Bantu peoples in the south of the country. Next. This is just a... a just a brief overview workflow. Um, again, I, I kind of touched on both of these. Most of my time has been dedicated to the ethnographic portion and collecting that data. Um, and then ultimately, as we're, I'm about to show next, when you bring these two things together, then we find the, the suitability uh, that reflects both cultural and ecological. Next. So this first map is just my raster showing ecological suitability. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult getting uh, good data. <laughs> it's always, especially when you're looking toward another country. Um, the large swath in the Northwest is, is a little bit troubling. That is directly due to uh, coarse temperature data. Um, and I think that, in, you know, when you look toward the South and Kapala, the capital, the most of that exclusion, uh, ecological exclusion is due to uh, just uh, urban land cover. Next. So now we're, we're bringing it together. We're bringing the cultural and we're bringing the ecological together. So this map reflects uh, ecological suitability with if a particular group just consumes plantain. Um, it may appear that the Lubara in the very Northwest are an outlier, but it's noted in, in multiple ethnographic works that they do in fact consume plantain. Um, I think that the exclusion of the Gweri people that are just Northeast of the Soga, so kind of in the central East of the country, I think that that might be a little bit of an outlier, but I just, I haven't been able to uncover any ethnographic work that, that reflects plantain consumption for those peoples. An interesting one, though, is the Japadola, which is in the just kind of southeast of, of those individuals. Um, that is actually, they are a Nilotic people, so their cultural horizon aligns more with the Karamajong in the northeast. So while they're surrounded by Bantu peoples, uh, they have maintained their cultural uh, practices with, uh, with regard to, to, to food consumption. Next. Now we're taking it to a little bit higher criteria, looking at it's ecologically suitable and is plantain considered a staple for these groups? 
And now we're really looking at the heart of, of plantain country in Uganda. And this certainly reflects with historical record and numerous ethnographic work and even my own personal experience in the country. Um, I do think that uh, it, it is a little bit exclusive and, and I'll explain why um, in some of the mountainous areas in the south, very southwest and uh, in the due east around Mount Elgon uh, on that map, I think that it, it doesn't quite extend quite as far as I think it should, uh, but I'll, I'll circle back to that in a moment. Now, this we're looking at it, both ecological suitability and is plantain uh, considered uh, or is used as part of an agroforestry system. This is absolutely reflective of where the historical production of plantain has always occurred. Uh, plantain was central to the Bugandan Empire. They uh, were one of the, they were a force majeure for the entire Great Lakes region for a very long time. And plantain was central to that as a means for taxation uh, for their subject uh, areas and peoples around them. Roads were built and uh, infrastructure and all these things uh, pre-colonial times uh, with through, through, through uh, plantain and their connection to plantain. Uh, but there are some issues with that just, and, and again, I'll circle back to that in just a moment. Uh, next. So, some, one of the points that I, I, I'm kind of wrestling with right now is the validation of this. You know, one of my things is I, I've taken, uh, had my, my advisor, given her some of these language groups to look up on her own and see if we reach the same result so that it's like, okay, well, we have confirmation that either, you know, we, we are seeing the same information through the ethnographic works or, or we're not. So far, things are lining up pretty well. I do think that, you know, the, given more time, I would like to uh, incorporate analytical hierarchy process so that I have a weighted uh, scheme for my criteria rather than just doing binary reclassification. I think for now it's effective enough, especially when you're looking at this at a national level in a, in a, in a very high level conception. Maybe if you're an NGO and you're like, okay, well, I can't conduct groundwork in the, in the target area, but I just need to roughly understand where this uh, technology could go or be implemented. I think it works well enough for that application. Um, and this is kind of a, one of the points I was mentioning earlier, that agroforestry is not something, it's not a term that is really used in ethnographic works. Not, you know, it's been around, the term's been used for the last 50 years, but it, it doesn't, uh, it's just not as extensively used. Um, so it, it, what may be actual agroforestry could just be individuals talking about traditional farming in their eyes as they see it. So um being able to qualify something as, as a group saying, okay, well, they use plantain as part of a, a current agroforestry system, it's a little difficult. And that's, so I think the results from that piece are a little bit unreliable. Um, and I, the other point I wanna make is that if indig the individuals that live in a specific community and they've lived there for generations, they're gonna know the land the best. And if they already implement a traditional mixed agricultural system or agroforestry system, they're going to be able to extend the range for where ecological suitability exists. So in, in my work, it, you know, my criteria say, well, it's not ecologically suitable there. That might just be, you know, that, that might actually be able to be extended a good bit by the microclimates that are formed by individuals that know how to get the most out of their land and thus extend the ecological suitability for a particular item. Next. So uh, again, I, I'm continuing to kind of go back through uh, my ethnographic work and see if I can find more uh, more quotes to pull that that, illust that indicate individuals that uh, either consume plantain or consider it as a staple or use it as an agroforestry system. Um, you know, I, I really hope that this is, is something that can be applied to other arenas where the inclusion of indigenous knowledge and cultural legacy can be brought into the power of GIS, uh, MCDA. Um, I, th I think you know things like fire management or land cover management and fire prescriptive fire practice is one area that, that comes to mind um, with that. And for me, you know, this this is a matter of being able to, to combine my undergraduate work in anthropology and work abroad uh, with the wonderful power of GIS. Next. 
Uh, these are just some of the sources for the image products that, if they weren't ones that I generated for myself. Next. That's it for me. Um, if I appreciate everyone's time. If you have any questions or comments, I welcome them. You can send them to the uh, address listed there. And um, thank you very much. Joshua, we do have one question. Um, would traditional Swidden style farming slash and burn as practiced by the Maya of the Yucatan be considered a form of agroforestry? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, I, I would need, I would have a better, I could have a better answer if I knew exactly what all they were incorporating. If we're talking about just slash and burn, like that is a practice for sure. It could be a traditional practice, but if they were incorporating, um, you know, let's say they had some, some upper story trees that they didn't cut and they left those for for partial shade or wind blockage, but then they did some burning of the understory where they would then replant, you know, or have multiple tiers of, of items then, you know, could be. Yeah, I mean, agroforestry comes in all, uh, many, many different schemes for sure. Okay, we've got one more question, but I think I'm going to leave that to you either to type an answer or if there's okay. time at the end, we can loop around because we do need to get to our final speaker. Okay. But thank you. That was very, uh, that was a great presentation.